I, my, my, my daughter Maggie has instilled in me I'm not allowed to start any talk without telling a joke first. So I'm going to tell you my quick joke this morning uh, and hope that I don't forget anything in my presentation here. Um, Patrick was talking to Seamus and he says, Seamus, have you tried the new restaurant? He says, oh yeah, Patrick, we have, you know. He says, was it good? He says, oh, it was delicious, yeah. He says, you know, he says, the food was delicious and they give you a good portion and uh, they give you a, a good pour of the Jamesons and the price weren't bad. Oh, we had a lovely time. He said, oh, it sounds lovely, Seamus. He said, now, Seamus, what was the name of the new restaurant? He says, the, the name of the new restaurant. He says, right, what was the name of the new restaurant? The, the name of the, the name, um, um, name of flower. He says, a flower. He says, yeah. He says, lily. He says, lily. No, it's not lily. He said, uh, hyacinth. He says, uh, hyacinth. No, it's not hyacinth. He said, rose. He said, rose. That's it, rose. Hey, rose, what was the name of that restaurant? <laughs> <laughs> I find myself more and more memory challenged, so that... Uh, the joke was a, real, a lot funnier the first time I heard it. Now it's hitting a little close to home. Okay, pay the piper. Th this is not bad. Is what I'm going to tell you this morning, not bad. Not bad. Uh, we've had a great year. We've had a great couple of years uh, since the bottom and the recovery and everything else. So we'll go to that first slide. I'm going to talk about debt. I'm going to talk about employment. I'm going to talk about the consumer, the economy and then stocks and bonds and valuations and what we see going forward. I do this every year and you all are kind of my guinea pig audience before I go and speak at the University of Delaware which I have been invited to do for the past nine years and I give a talk there every year on my economic and market forecast with one of the Fed presidents and I've spoken with, uh, shared the stage, been great privilege with Charlie Plosser from the Philadelphia Fed for a few years, uh, Jeff Lacker from uh, Richmond. Uh, this year I'll be speaking uh, and sharing the stage with James Bullard from the St. Louis Fed. And James Bullard's a really interesting guy this year because when the market started to go down in October, it was uh, Fed President Bullard who came, went on out into the media and said, well, maybe the Fed should do more. And the market went right back up. So I, I was going to write about that and be very critical of him because I found that a rather hypocritical thing for Jim to do given all of the other things he'd been saying. But I remembered that I'm going to be sharing the stage and speaking with him later and I thought I probably shouldn't be too uh, nasty to him before I get to do that. He might be nasty back. Anyway, deleveraging has not been allowed to run its courts. Deleveraging. We took on a lot of leverage in uh, leading up to 2007 and 2008. A lot of debt. Consumers had a lot of debt. A lot of credit card bills. You remember I said we, everybody had a flat screen TV. has been my, one of my examples in the past. Labor market is weaker than you see in the headlines. And that's important. I'm going to tell you why. The economic recovery remains very unbalanced. It's been a theme of years now. The rich have gotten richer. Everybody else, not so much. That's not a political comment, okay? People want to, there's a lot of ways to politicize that. That's just economics. Uh, stocks have had a great run. They're no longer cheap. Everybody, lots of people want to come out now and make an argument that stocks are still very reasonably priced at 16 times earnings. I don't think they are so much, and I'm going to tell you why. Defense may be the best offense for a while longer, and U.S. stocks, relatively attractive, um, versus the rest of the world and bonds. So just those last two things I just told you, we're not cheap, but we still are okay. And that probably is, is the, if I'm going to sum up what I'm going to tell you this morning, that could be it. Okay, let's go. The debt problem. Said I was going to talk about debt. Let's go. We have a lot more of it. That's, that's what I want you to see here. Households and nonprofits non-financials and businesses, state and local government. These are in trillions. This number is about $55 trillion. Trillions. Let's go next. 
Again, debt as a percentage of GDP, debt as a percentage of GDP, uh, non-financial businesses, households and non-profits, it's just breaking out that other graph and showing you what it's made of. Uh, this is a lot of debt. The government has a lot of debt. When the government has a lot of debt, the government has to pay a lot of interest. The interest rates are very low. That's still a, a problem and a headwind, but if interest rates go up and you have a whole lot of debt, then all of a sudden the government's spending a lot of money on servicing their debt, making their interest payments on their big mortgage, right? And they're not able to reinvest and they're not able to spend it on other things or fund other programs. So uh, it starts to act as a significant drag on economic growth. GDP growth will slow as the expense of that debt increases and the debt is increasing in and of itself. So let's go next. Household and federal government debt. Consumer debt has effectively been transferred to the federal government. Consumers were wild, wildly over leveraged in 2007. They took on a whole lot of debt. They borrowed for everything. They took zero pay, uh, interest loans for cars and trucks and RVs and buy it now and don't make a payment for nine months, all of those sorts of things. They've kind of faded into some past memory. You can still get, I think, no interest rate loans to buy a car. But consumers spent, and, but consumers, so as consumers took up their debt, they've paid off, they've transferred some of their debt. The government has taken on the debt in this exchange. The government has taken on the debt. Let's go next. Business debt. We're seeing business debt increase because stock buybacks are going up. Interest rates are so low, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, that companies are able to borrow cheaply, borrow cheaply, and take that money and buy back shares in the market. We'll talk about why that's a good strategy for them, but it's taking that business debt back up. Next. Labor market. These up and down orange lines are the change in non-farm payrolls. And so you see what happened in 2009, and unemployment got to about 10% when the change in payrolls goes down and the unemployment rate goes up to almost 10%. And now the unemployment rate has come down below 6%, 5.9, 5.8, something like that. And we've seen an improvement in, in jobs and payrolls. Let's go next. Here are some more labor metrics. We, uh, this is the civilian labor force, total civilian labor force of the whole population. These people are not in the labor force. And this line, this yellow line, is the labor force participation rate. How many people who are of working age are considered a part of that labor force who are actually out working uh, and have jobs? That's coming down, and that's been structural since 2000. And when I say structural, hi, John. Uh, structural since 2000, I mean uh, uh, that we've had all the baby boomers who've started to retire. That big part of the bell curve in the population has started to retire. Uh, there are some other people after unemployment just gave up work looking for another job. So, uh, but fewer people are working in that whole group. Next. Cumulative change in the civilian, non, don't, don't worry about this, non-institutional population and number of employed. What I want to show you here is this is kind of an even line going back to 2007. Sorry. 2007. After 2007, unemployment started. These blue lines basically are showing you unemployed. And this little blue line over here tells you that we now have more people employed in an absolute number than we had in 2007. So all through this period, 2012 and 2013, even though you saw the unemployment rate falling and you saw all of these good job numbers, we had a lot of ground to make up. We have now made it up on an absolute basis. What does the orange line show? The orange line shows that the population and those available to work has grown by 15 million people. So while we have a few more employed than we had employed in 2007, we've got 15 million more people in this country who could work. Let's go next. 
the jobs that have been added have not been really high quality jobs. We've had a lot of, you can see the real growth in part-time jobs is the blue line. And these are full-time jobs. Part-time jobs uh, have not been, uh, are, are not that great in terms of providing income to the consumer. What we've talked about for years, when, when you consider the US GDP, it's 70% driven by the consumer. Okay? So if the, consum the consumer has to have money and means to consume. They either have to have earnings and jobs, or they have to be able to take on some debt. They have to get some money from somewhere. What's fueling the fuel of our GDP? That's what we're looking at here uh, when we're looking at jobs and the quality of jobs and the money and so forth and the debt burdens. Let's go next. So, how much money does the consumer have? Median income in this country in 1990 was 52 or 51,000. We can come up to about 1995 and we'll see, I guess 1995, and we'll see that pretty much we're exactly where we are today. Adjusted for inflation in 2013 dollars, the median household income in the United States for the average income family, average $52,000 per household. Think about living on that. Think about what you're going to spend your money on. Think about your bills. Think about what kind of rent you can afford. Huh? At what are we talking? $4,200 a month? Something like that? $4,200 a month in your household income. What can you afford in terms of rent, utilities, food, car payment, gasoline, insurance? Go through your budget. And that's what the average huge swath of America is doing every day. So how are they going to increase consumption? How are they going to buy more? Let's go next. So personal savings as a percentage of disposable uh, income uh, is at about 5%. About 5%. Post-war average, 8.8%. This is the, uh, what economists call the paradox of thrift. If the consumer is saving, the consumer isn't spending. If the consumer isn't spending, the economy isn't growing. So good for the consumer, not so good for the economy. You've heard presidents before, and Ronald Reagan did it at one point and came out and said, go buy something. You've been holding off on the refrigerator. Go buy it. Right? Let's go next. The average savings rate long term is 8.8%. We're still below that, but I'm happy to see the consumer savings. We had a negative savings rate back in uh, before to around 2007 or so, 2008. Consumer confidence by income. What does this say? It says the people who have more incomes are more confident. That's really what this says. Why am I talking about consumer confidence? Let's go to the next slide. I want to show something else. Um, I'm talking about consumer confidence because you, if you're a buyer, you have to not only be able to buy, you have to be willing to buy. You have to feel good about buying. Um, you remember in 2008 and 2009 when the markets were coming down, what did you feel like buying? What sort of major purchase would you consider when the market was going to 7,000? I, I don't know about you, but I, I mean, I was all hands on deck and we weren't going to spend a nickel on anything extra. When you feel bad, you don't spend. If you feel good, you spend. Which is one of those problems with stock market investing, isn't it? Warren Buffett says that Americans are funny. They love stocks when they're expensive and they hate them when they're cheap. In 2008 and 2009, I had many of our clients say, Sell it, get me out, I never want to look at another stock. And we said, we think stocks look pretty reasonably valued, they look cheap to us. I don't care what you think, Michael Farr. And they had that tone that my mother gets with me too. She, she, she's not here this morning to take the brunt of that, but uh, you know, I don't care what you think, Michael Farr, I'm, I, I can't, I'm out, I'm out, I'm not doing this. So, the attitude is very important. How do you feel now about buying stocks? 
Anytime I start feeling kind of comfy cozy about, oh yeah, let's buy that. Careful, careful. So consumer spending, interest rates are low, these are positives. Commodity prices, gas and food, food maybe not so much, gas has been coming down. Loosening lending standards, it's still tough to get a loan, but they're loosening a bit. Consumer credit growth, it's been ticking up a little. Negatives, not that the number of people working and the types of job they have. Weak income growth, if any. Higher cost of education, health care and housing, and a higher savings rate, not going to drive spending. Go ahead, next. Okay, optimism. <laughs> I, in 19, in uh, I think it was 2008 or 2009, someone at this breakfast accused me of selling membership in the Hemlock Society. Uh, I, I hope you, he said I'd have been successful too. Uh, I, I hope you don't feel that way this morning. Uh, Ten-year treasury yield and mortgage rates, still very reasonable and coming down. Think about your expectations here too, because I think this is hugely important and one of the most important things you can think of as an investor. What do you think is going to happen to interest rates? We're at around two and a quarter percent. Did you think a year ago, when we were around 2.4 percent, and I'm making that up, but I think it's probably close. Did you think that we would fall to two and a quarter percent over the course of this year? Did you think interest rates would stay this low for this long? Did you think that the stock market in 2013 would go up over 30 percent? Did you think it would add another 10, 12 percent this year? Well, I didn't, okay? I didn't. Uh, if that makes you any more comfortable in admitting that you're there with me, so it makes, I think it really begs the most important question about investing. What difference does it make what we think? It doesn't make a difference what we think. Our opinions and our attitudes, it makes, so what, what makes a difference? The numbers make a difference. The only thing that's going to prove out over time are these numbers. And then you're just sort of along for what has been a very good ride that will have some pits and peaks. Next. Inflation metrics, government says there isn't any. What's next? Dollar index versus the commodity index. All right. When the dollar rises in value, uh, this is my dollar index here, it can buy more commodities. So commodity prices fall. They always seem to go each way, okay? So commodities becoming less expensive as the dollar index goes up here. Um, let's go next. Oil and gas prices coming down. Do you, this is one of my best, I think, lessons about investing and thinking about what you know. March 31st, 2008, oil closed at $100 a barrel. March 31st, 2008. The markets were still fine. The Federal Reserve had saved Bear Stearns on March 17th, 2008. It was a Saturday. And bank stocks rallied for the second quarter of 2008 because the Fed had averted a financial crisis in the U.S. That's what the headline said. Oil was $100 a barrel March 31st. On June the 24th, 2008, oil was 147 and a half. Okay. In an 84-day period, the price of a global economy went up 47.5%. 47.5% in the price of a global commodity in 84 days. And what did Wall Street say? Well, of course, is what they said. Of course, that makes sense. Hmm? Goldman Sachs said it was going to go to $200 a barrel. Some analysts came out and said it was going to $1,000 a barrel. The analyst from Goldman Sachs, I had this 28-year-old come in and talk to me, and he really lectured me, and he told me I was stupid, and I, he, I swear, he really did, and I was inclined to believe him because I had no damned idea why oil had just gone from 100 to 147 in 84 days, and he said, you don't get it. I said, we've established that. <laughs> he said, the barrel per capita Usage in the U.S. is up two and a half times since 1975. 
India is a developing economy. China is a developing economy. We have cities being built. We have all these things happening. They're using oil all over the world at a much faster rate. I said, great, got it. He says, you? I said, I've got it. I said, here's what I don't got. What I don't got is, is any of that news in the last three years. Did we know all that three years ago? Did we know the per barrel per capita? Did we know about India and China three years ago when oil was $30 a barrel? When things don't make sense, one of the hardest things to do as an investor is to become dispassionate and disciplined and step back and say, I don't understand what's going on. I will risk the world calling me stupid again, but I'm going to step back. And I'm going to take, take some time here. So this is coming down. Does it make sense? I don't know yet. I don't know. It's not a sign that the economy globally is growing. Let's go next. Change in GDP components. We've seen some growth, right? Exports are up. Hmm? Uh, government. Private investment, that's been increasing very nicely. Personal consumption, straight line, personal consumption. Let's go next. So GDP's been improving. But we have some pressures on this GDP growth. There are four elements to GDP. We've talked about them before. The consumer, private investment, okay, CapEx, government, and exports. Consumer spending, we've got low quality jobs and stagnant incomes. Uh, inadequate retirement savings. I think this is a really big point. Americans are not prepared. All these baby boomers do not have savings. They're not prepared to live longer uh, and to fund their retirements. And a lot of their non-discretionary expenses are rising too. Housing rebound seems to be ebbing. We saw lower mortgage applications uh, this morning. Um, so the housing rebound seems to be getting a little bit quiet here. We have a massive debt burden for the government. They have to pay that debt back sooner or later and interest on that debt. Rising dollar, weak growth outside the U.S. is going to put a little bit of pressure here. So why am I showing you that? Not to depress you, but if, if people who are saying we're getting ready to have 5 and 6% GDP growth, where in the hell is it going to come from? Look at the numbers, right? It's fun to talk about these big headlines and make these proclamations, but look at the numbers. Be dispassionate, look at the numbers. Next slide. So GDP and personal consumption. Where goeth GDP growth, so goeth personal consumption. Personal consumption drives GDP. Personal consumption is just that consumer again, two-thirds of the economy. If two-thirds of the economy is in, it goes up. If two-thirds of the economy is out, it don't. Okay, let's go next. So come on about stocks. Here we go. Hey, other than this little thingy here, not so bad. What do you think? <laughs> This was a real stomach uh, churner. But going back to 1996, the S&P has had annualized returns of 8.5%. You can check Farmiller and Washington's performance full of disclosures and disclaimers. Uh, and you want to check all of the disclosures and disclaimers so that Susan doesn't shoot me later as head of compliance. But Farmiller and Washington's performance has been better than that 8.5%, I'm very happy to say. In the four major market downturns of the last 20 years, Farm Miller and Washington's performance has outperformed those. Because I've been defensive, because our team has been defensive, because we have stuck with numbers during times of passion. What does that mean? When you stick with numbers in times of passion, this is a time of passion, folks. We've had over 45 new all-time highs on the Dow Jones Industrial Average in 2014. Over 45 days closing all-time new highs. Now, the first rule I learned in this business was the buy low, sell high. 45 new highs. Are you feeling still like you'd more like to buy today or sell today, right? I don't time the markets and I don't get in and out and I don't sell very often. We do continue to sell things that are really expensive and we buy things that we feel are less expensive and represent better value and that's how we've been able to outperform in those down markets. 
but staying dispassionate is tough. I'm going to show you what's really been driving the market this year. Uh, last year we had a very good year and outperformed, but uh, we study this performance stuff. This year we're a little bit behind the market. I'm not worried about it, but let me show you why. Let's go next. So household net worth. Is this fabulous? Look at this since 1904, but we can come up in here through 2008. There was a $13 trillion loss, $13 trillion in 2008. You all have heard me, some of you have come to these breakfasts before, have heard me do this before. I would go and talk to the high schools. I would hand them, I would pull a kid up. I'd hand the kid $10. Actually, I didn't. First time I did this, I would stand there and I'd say, okay, everybody in the room, we're going to count 1 1,000 to 10 seconds. 1 1,000, 2 1,000, 3 1,000. I'd hand the kid the money till I got to 10. How long do I have to stand here? to hand Tom Casey a million dollars, 24-7 at one a second, just over 12 days, nonstop, round the clock to hand him a million dollars. That's how much a million dollars is. What I learned was to ha hand the kid the $10 singles when I first got there and have him count them back to me because the damn kid would walk out with my 10 after I counted him to them. So you learn, you see, you learn. It's this investment business by your mistakes. How long do we stand here for me to hand Tom a billion dollars? A billion. Just over 32 years. No bathroom breaks. <laughs> Just over 32 years. That's a billion. <laughs> We're talking trillions. It's unfathomable. I, we, we, we manage now about a billion two. I don't know what a trillion dollars looks like. I cannot even get it in my head. Let's go next. Tina has worked. No other place to put money, no other place to invest, has forced money into all sorts of asset classes. But if you really thought in January 2013 that gold was the place to be, wrong. Sorry, didn't work. If you like the S&P 500, good on you. Other asset classes did pretty well. Uh, Non-US developing markets, developed markets, not so much. Let's go next. So when you buy the S&P 500, you get these things in there. That's in, those things are in the index, those stocks, if you can't see them. But Tesla, Tesla, fabulous. If, if you haven't driven one, they are so cool. I've driven one. It is really cool. Uh, Netflix, Facebook, Salesforce, LinkedIn, Amazon. Now, those companies over the last three years collectively are up 308%. If you'd invested in that list for the last three years, you'd be up 308%. Price to earnings ratio right now, on average, 122 times earnings. The cheapest one's Facebook at 39 times earnings. I'm never going to own those stocks in a client's portfolio. To perform and catch these thin branches, I needed to own those stocks. And stocks like them, right? I mean, we could get into Yelp or uh, Twitter or you've got to have earnings. I'm not going to own you if you don't have a good balance sheet and earnings because I don't know when things are going to go down. And when things go down and the music stops, I need to make sure that I have a seat for my client. That's what I get paid to do. Next, please. Trailing one year returns by PE quintile, price to earnings quintile. So. 35 times earnings, look what's driven this market's return. Stocks that were 35 times earnings have driven the returns of 30%. 24 times earnings, up over 20%. 16 times earnings, which is the average for the S&P, right around 10%. Let's go next. So risky stuff goes well in a bull market, right? That's a bull market indicator. Risk on. Doesn't matter what we own, let's own risk because the market's going up. If the market's going up, the more risk you have, the more you're going to get paid. And everybody likes it. And nobody feels risky when they're making money. If it goes up, you feel good. And you don't feel like you've done something risky because you're making money. 
Let me tell you what happens when you own a stock at 100 times earnings and the market turns south. You're not so happy and you understand risk a lot better. These are the ratings of the S&P 500 companies and their returns. So these are the single B ratings. These are junk companies. These would be junk bond ratings over in here. Returns over here. Returns here. There are only three AAA companies. Do you know that? Only three AAA companies uh, anymore. Uh, Exxon, Johnson & Johnson, and Microsoft. Isn't that a shame? Oh, by the way, that includes the U.S. government. U.S. government's a double A. I'm not sure it's a strong double A either. Let's go next. So, earnings continue. Let's look at earnings and decide. Now, I want to talk about whether stocks are expensive or not. Earnings uh, and revenue growth. Earnings have been growing faster than revenues for quite a while. Earnings growth faster than revenues. So let's think about that for a minute. How does, how does that happen? If my company, or my lemonade stand, sells another $100 worth of lemonade, lots of cups of lemonade, but I sell $100 more worth of lemonade, how do I have my earnings go up? Because I have a fixed cost for my lemons and my sugar and my ice and my paper cups. How do my earnings go up uh, faster faster than just the $100 growth in my lemonade sales? Well, if I sell them in the same amount of hours and my rent doesn't go up and I don't have to pay my employees anymore, I don't have to pay my employees anymore. I've got a fixed cost for my employees who are going to stand there for eight hours and sell lemonade. They cost me the same number. I've now been able to make more money on the same cost basis. So perhaps that $100 top line can actually show greater bottom line growth. But there's something else going on here. Let's go next. Corporate profits. Do I have another slide there, Keith? I can't remember. That the, they're going to on buybacks. All right, thank you. Um, I, I, buybacks are really the key to that last slide. I'm going to talk to you about these share repurchases. And I told you that interest rates were low and that people were, the companies were borrowing money to buy back shares. That's, I want you to remember that one slide. So corporate profits is a percentage of GDP. I've talked about this a number of years now, but it's at an all-time high. This is one consistently uh, mean reverting datum. It's here. Why are profits so high? Labor costs are low. When unemployment's high, you don't have to give anybody a raise because you've got six people waiting for that person's job. I don't have to give you a raise. I can hire the three other guys in line for the same or lower money. Um, interest rates are low. I can borrow more cheaply. I can do a lot of things, and I have a lot of... But sooner or later, as the economy recovers and interest rates start to go back up, and employment becomes fuller, and I don't have those three people waiting for that job, sooner or later I've got to give Cheston a raise. I, I dread the day, you know, Cheston. M Michael Fox, our CFO, is shaking his head, no, no, we don't have to give Cheston a raise. Uh, but when I do have to ultimately give Cheston a raise here, as much as I dread it, uh, it's going to hurt my earnings, my, my, my profit margins, right? So interest rates go up. Farm Miller in Washington, by the way, has no debt. So that one isn't going to nail me, but the other ones do. We're, very cons we're as conservative in the way we manage our company as we tell everybody to be. Let's go next. If you take the, that, go back one slide for one second. Taking this number down to the mean again, let's just take today's margins down to the mean and see where earnings would be if we were back at the mean. Now next. We'd be at 26, 27 times earnings if we were at mean earnings. These are the reasons I'm suggesting that I think stocks are fully valued on the whole. Okay, what do I know? I know that stocks can be fully valued and stay that way for a really long time. And maybe if we have this continued 2% GDP growth for a long time and, can, and stay in this low rate environment and the consumer can kind of just keep trotting and plodding along, this maybe lasts for a long time. I don't know. Because I don't know, it's really important to know what I own and why I own it. 
But I'm not going to be worried about not owning Netflix in this kind of an environment. Let's go next, please. So, corporate profits. Thank you, Keith. Uh, um, corporate profits, low consumer savings rate, high federal budget deficits, basically increased revenues, labor market slack. These are lower operating expenses. Labor market slack, idle factory capacity, cost cutting, deferral investments, lower interest expense, lower tax rates, and stock buybacks. I'm coming to it again. Let's go next. Um, activist investors, more harm than good? I think so. Activist investors make companies make decisions for the short term to drive stock prices in the short term, which are not necessarily long, good for the long term growth and health of a company. Uh, they will tell you to increase your debt levels. They will uh, get into buying back stock to increase earnings per share. So we showed you earlier that corporate debt had increased. We've seen these profit margins uh, increase, earnings margins increase. Um, why? I can borrow money cheaply. I go out into the market and I buy back a bunch of shares. What's my, and then, I, then all of a sudden I've got my $1,000 in earnings that I divide over fewer shares and I have more greater earnings per share. I just reduce the share count. I don't have to make more money, actually. I just have to reduce part of the equation, which is the number of shares outstanding, and that's been driving earnings higher. Is it real? No. Not really, but they've added debt to get there. So there's a burden that they're going to have to continue to finance, but um, you know, tomorrow we'll worry about that, not so much today. Forego uh, foregoing investments in, in long-term growth, they don't want to see, uh, activist investors don't want to see a company spend money uh, for something that's going to have returns over the next 10 years. They don't care about the next 10 years, they want now. Let's go next. You don't fight the Fed. Market timing, I don't think, this is, you start here. Nobody can effectively time the markets with any degree of consistency or precision. You, you may have heard of, uh, what do they call them, tactical investors, Jennifer, is that what the tactical managers, tactical, yeah. Tactical managers, there are tactical money managers now and they've gotten very popular over the last five or six years and what they tell you is they know how to get in and get out. They're going to take you to cash at the right time. When things look expensive, they tell you, and they've got algorithms that will show you that when things are expensive, they're going to reduce your exposure to the market. And when the algorithm changes and things get inexpensive, they're going to put you back into the market. And therefore, you're not going to have money in the market when it goes down, and you're only going to have money in the market when it goes up. And I've got a bridge in Brooklyn for sale. I've seen these guys for years, and they do really well after you've had several years of a bull market because they don't have any bad numbers to, to, to prove to you. <laughs> and you're feeling a little worried because things are expensive and somebody's going to offer you this wonderful panacea. I'm telling you it doesn't work. Avoid emotional decision making. Don't fight the Fed. God, have we learned that. Trends always last longer than anybody ever expects they will, says our partner John Washington. Capital gains taxes are, are, are a big tax when you try and get in and out of stocks. Lack of investment alternatives right now if you wanted to get out and get in, and uh, the timing of re-entry. Quick story. I drive Keith crazy when I go off on tangents like this because it makes my talk run over, but anyway. 2008, it was October 7th or 8th, something like that. I was sitting at home uh, with, with Laurie. Laurie's the longest uh, actual uh, devoted employee of Far Miller in Washington, my wife Laurie. We were sitting on the sofa and I got a call that night saying uh, we need you on the Today Show tomorrow morning. I said you need me on the Today Show tomorrow morning. Why? Jim Cramer just went on this morning and he had driven the NBC Universal lawyers out of their minds crazy, <laughs> which he does frequently, uh, uh, by saying that if you needed any money you should sell everything. Sell everything that you're going to need for the next five years. This thing is going down and it's serious. Well, you might be able to say that on CNBC, but you can't say that on the Today Show when your audience is less sophisticated. I mean, Fred and Ethel don't know what to think about that. So they needed me to go on 
and, and calm the waters, which I did. But, um, and I said, you know, I don't think Jim said anything that anybody, any professional wouldn't say. If you need money in the near term, you don't have it tied up in long-term investments. A anybody will tell you that in, in, in a financial professional. The market was about 10,000. And of course it went down to 7,000 and Kramer crowed and crowed and crowed and I saw him and he says, you saved me, but I was right. You saved me, but I was right. Jim, you were right. October 8th, 2009, one year later, market's back at 10,000. By the end of November, we were up 4%. So what if you sold when Kramer told you to sell and you, sold at 10,000 and the market goes to seven and you're sitting in cash. Can you imagine how much longer and flexible the arm muscles would have gotten so you could pat yourself on the back, huh? When it got down to 7,000, wouldn't you just be gleeful? And what if I had come up to you right at that moment, right at the low and said, now, Put all your money back in now. You'd have thrown me out of your house, right? You'd have said I was crazy. When it started to go back up, when would you have thought it was okay? When would you have felt good enough? What sort of capital gains taxes would you have paid? Where, where would, doesn't work is my point. Next. <laughs> I can go on and on. Okay. I think you have to be defensive in a portfolio construction, so we have low debt on the companies we own. We have strong cash flow. If you have money coming in, you can survive a whole bunch of stuff. Who doesn't know that? Ability to self-finance operations. You don't have to sell stock. Less cyclical industries, particularly in a rising rate environment. You don't want to be in cyclical industries. Competitive moats, barriers to entry in your business, sustainable cost structures, Proprietary technologies, I love that, companies like Qualcomm's, at least they have their patents. Track records during past recession. How have you done when things were awful before? How did management do through other recessions? It matters. Like dividend yield, a little bit. Valuation is important. Let's go next. So I showed you this list last year. Uh, I, I continue to think that a list like this makes more sense. This is not a recommendation, Susan's looking at me, this is not a recommendation to buy or sell any of these names. It's simply an illustration. Don't run out and buy these names, please. Uh, United Technologies, Pepsi, Qualcomm, Procter & Gamble, Walmart, CVS, Johnson & Johnson, Medtronic, Microsoft, uh, Exxon, Mobil, Lou, I put Medtronic in for you. Uh, if, it's, if those stocks have a similar multiple, we're 16 and a half times, 16 times earnings, just like the S&P, but earnings growth at 9% as an estimate is almost twice the earnings growth estimated for the S&P, and I get a 2.3% dividend while I wait, why wouldn't I do that? Why would I take the risk? Why would I go to Netflix and Yahoo and whatever the hell those other companies are when I can do this. Money's too hard to make. I keep carrying this around. I need to drink it. Let's go next. So, this has worked for us. This is what we do. This has worked. Let's go next. Don't bet against America. Why do we invest? We invest because over the next 10 years, we think that American corporations are going to be bigger. We think that there's going to be a larger population in the U.S that this is still a free capitalistic society. Innovation is still rewarded and protected. We have a stable democratic government, no matter what you think of it. Uh, we have a very, we, we, we boast peaceful transitions of government. It's terrific. Positive demographic trends. China doesn't have positive demographic trends. We do. Rising productivity, they have something else though. Rising productivity, inflation interest rates are low for now, stock valuations for quality companies, they're okay. They're okay. Balance sheets are strong. You have to be careful what you own. So, the economy is recovering slowly. It is being fueled. That recovery is being fueled by an enormous amount of debt. 
we've had five trillion dollars in deficit spending over the past six years. The United States government has spent five trillion dollars more than that took in over the last six years. Five trillion dollars. They did that with a 15 trillion dollar economy. They basically shoved in another five trillion dollars. The Federal Reserve added another four trillion dollars on its balance sheet. Nine trillion dollars have been shoved in to a 15 trillion dollar economy to generate 2% GDP growth. I would tell you that's not a good trade, <laughs> but they've done it. And there are some, th th there are some problems and consequences. Um, it's going to be very hard for folks getting ready to retire, I think, to get the returns they're going to need to fund their retirement. When you buy high, it's hard to get a great perspective return in the future. And interest rates are so low, retirees are struggling now, but future retirees are going to struggle more. So people will work longer. But anyway, you, know, you, shove, you shove $9 trillion into a $15 trillion economy. I can shove a billion dollars into a dead horse and get him to take a lap around the track. <laughs> this is cause and effect. So when you hear folks on TV and my compadres saying, isn't the economy resilient? Isn't it wonderful, the recovery we're having? We ought to have a recovery. We ought to have a fabulous recovery. We ought to have a lot of things. You should have a lot more for $9 trillion. It's not awful. It's okay. But my advice and the advice of Farm Miller in Washington is to own good quality stocks and bonds and make sure that y you will say, look, I will accept, I, this is what I tell everybody I talk to, I will accept a lower return for significantly lower risk any day. I don't need that last percent if I can really manage my risk better and, and stay out of the thin branches. So uh, we think that you be cautious. We think that you try to remain disciplined and dispassionate. And if you need some help, if you need some hand-holding, if you want to talk about a longer-term strategy, we'd be delighted to help you. I thank you so much for coming and listening to me this morning. And if you have questions, I'll answer them. And if you have anyone who you think would be a good client at Farm Miller in Washington, or you have a couple of extra million in your handbag, we'd be delighted to help you with that this morning, too. I thank you very, very much.